Hey guys, welcome back to another day of DFS Den, part of the Fantasy Six Pack channel. And if you want me to do these amazing intros, you have to like and subscribe. That's a rule, right? <laughs> and comment, all right? Just give me a compliment. The best comment will get pinned, and I'm deciding. And I'm going to give it to the pros now, Keith and Dave, my dad. What's up, there everyone? Go, this is the DFS Den. If you're wondering, uh, no, Chris is not sick uh, and has lost a bunch of weight. He is just not here tonight. Uh, I am going to be filling in for him. Very excited to be working with Dave. But, I mean, literally the reason me and Joe came over to the show was to work with these guys. I'm pumped to be here, Dave. I I'm very thrilled to have you, Keith. I I've watched a little bit of your work. I'm a big fan. Um, as a matter of fact, you kind of talked me into something on your last video um, that you did last night, as a matter of fact. And so that's something that I, I will actually address when we get to it, just so that, that you know what I'm talking about. But um, we've had a tremendous intro. Hopefully he gets some good comments. Um, he always enjoys getting the comments. It, it really helps boost his ego a little bit. So Oh, so I, truly, I love the showmanship. <laughs> so if if you did enjoy it, go ahead drop him drop him a couple comments. I promise he'll see them. Um, he's got his own um, he's got his own YouTube and his own YouTube account. So he logs in and he 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 looks for him. So <laughs> it really truly would make his day by dropping something nice for him. But Keith, it is week four. I don't know how it's week four, but it is week four. And uh, I'm ready to talk some some DFS here, man. Uh, you know, my cash pool, which is only available um, on our private Discord over, at, you know, for Fantasy Six Pack. All access members can hop in there. Cash pool has provided three straight winning weeks. So if you haven't joined yet, especially if you haven't been winning, if you haven't won every single week this year and doubled your money, I have no idea why you haven't gone to fantasysixpack.net slash plan, signed up, and, you know, check out what we got going on. It's not too late. I've got, you know, a cash pool in there right now. I usually put it in on Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, typically updated on Thursday or Friday, definitely by Friday, and then go ahead and update it again on Sunday before lock, before we go live. So no reason in the world to, to not sign up. It's not too expensive. If if you don't like it, you can always, you know, cancel it, I guess. But I haven't had anybody cancel yet. Yeah, I haven't had anybody cancel yet. Everyone is just thrilled in there. We have the best. We have the best time. Um, but I digress, Keith. Let's talk about quarterbacks. Well, who's got your eye? Well, it's it's one of those weeks where I, I understand if you want to go, you know, with Herbert or Tua, but I, I really like the QBs further down, um, especially you know in bigger fields. I think this is a week Justin Fields finally does something. Uh, what we've seen with the Broncos and their tackling issues, and they definitely have tackling issues. I treat Fields as a running back, uh, not a quarterback. What I like about him is you can use him, I think, without stacking with a receiver because, sure. I mean, who knows how many times he's going to throw it. And basically you're hoping that he has that big rushing game, which he has not had yet. This is by far his best opportunity. The Broncos have been dreadful. Uh, versus the run game. I mean, not just because of the game in Miami, but dreadful uh, in general. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it was not a one week deal. It was just yeah. that was, uh, I think, definitely got everybody's attention. Um, I, I'm on Joe Burrow, even though I understand mm. the concerns, uh, you know, because of the injury, the Bengals haven't looked right, but the Titans are so bad versus the pass. Uh, me and my co host of the DFS Thursday show, we've been picking on the Titans for literally a year and a half now. Uh, we figured out early last year they couldn't cover. And, you know, Joe always talks about the great thing about the Titans is they're so good against the run. Yes. The teams are kind of forced to throw against them anyway. It's one of those weird deals where it's actually better for teams to, to throw on them, but they still you know, try to run early in the game to no effect. And Do you know what uh, we call that? You know what the term for that is, Keith? I don't. It, it's called a pass funnel. They're so good against the run – that every they get it gets funneled to the pass. So in real life, it doesn't necessarily mean that their pass defense is terrible because the Titans have a good defense. It just means that they're so damn good at the run that either teams don't really give it a whirl or they are very unsuccessful and they're forced to pass. So we call that a pass funnel. 
That makes a lot of sense because, like, last year, again, they had 500 more passing yards allowed yeah. than 30 of the 32 NFL teams. And then if you look at this year, they're, again, in the top six or seven teams in passing yards allowed. And they haven't exactly played the most stellar group of quarterbacks. <laughs> no. Uh, you know, car week one, 300 yards. Uh, so I, I just think that if they were going to get right, this is the week. Uh, and I also just like that both of the receivers – or a little underpriced chase because yeah. he's, you know, got off to a slow start. And then Higgins, because it's maybe it's an every other week deal, right? We knew week one, he had a terrible game. Uh, week two, he had a monster game. And last week he looked terrible on the field as well, <laughs> dropping numerous passes. I don't know what was going on, but I really like the value in this 58, 57, 5,600 <clears throat> range on DK. That's where most of my lineups are this week. And yes, Denver has been bad, and I know a lot's been made of, but Russell Wilson has been a very good fantasy quarterback. Like, he's scoring yep. points for the price range he's in, for sure. Uh, you got a lot of options. I talked about them in my stack article where Williams is cheap, again, against a, a, another defense that can't really stop the run in Chicago. Uh, obviously, we hope Mims is going to maybe get a little bit more involved. You got Judy. That, that There's ways to build a lineup with him uh, that I think can be very fruitful for you. I love Matthew Stafford this week. Uh, I, I do want to make sure the left tackle is okay and going to play uh, because if he is not, I'm a little concerned because of the way he looked at the end of that game. But <laughs> I'm discounting a little bit of the Cincy game because that was a desperate team. They had to win, uh, and they played really well. But Stafford still scored 13 points, I think eight points on DK. Uh, and Indy is just right now a treasure trove. Two quarterbacks and receivers. They've given up already over 500 yards receiving on the season, four touchdowns. And because I'm a stat nerd, I went back and looked at the last 13 games that Matthew Stafford played indoors. 24 touchdowns in those games. At least one passing touchdown in each one of them and averaging 286 yards per. We know that he played in a dome row in his career with Detroit. Uh, and then the other guy, C.J. Stroud <laughs> for the Texans, um, I, I just, man, I, I was so wrong about this guy. I, I was one of the people thinking he wasn't going to be any good. You look at the history of Ohio State yeah. quarterbacks. Yeah. He's proved me wrong, and I don't normally say that this early in the season, but he's throwing it 40 times a game and is not throwing an interception. That's incredible for a rookie quarterback. Like, it's one thing when Desmond Ritter was throwing it like 24 times a game last year for my Falcons Gross. and wasn't throwing interception. When you're throwing it 40 times a game behind a bad offensive line, yeah. And then again, you got some great options and, you know, Tank Dell uh, that, you know, that's my favorite one to stack him with. But Nico Collins had a little bit of an off game. He'll be back. Don't worry. Uh, and I think this is going to be a game that, again, the Steelers are a team that are good against the run. We know the Texans can't run the ball. So they're going to air it out. The only other guy I like considering, and I'm not crazy about it. I liked it a lot more when I thought the Red Rifle was starting. But mm -hmm. even Bryce Young this week. Uh, Seattle, again, one of the top teams in the league in passing yards allowed. If you're looking for – or excuse me, Minnesota, sorry. One of the top teams in passing yards allowed. Adam Thielen revenge game. Uh, I can see, you know, putting him with maybe Adam Thielen. If you want to use Shark, if you want to use Mingo, there's, again, a lot of cheap options with it. I'm not thrilled about it. Again, I wish Dalton was playing. That was actually in my values article, and I thought Dalton was going to start this week. But – the QB range for me is really the, the Russell kind of Stafford Stroud, especially in bigger entries. That's where I would hammer it. So one thing I want to uh, want to point out, and I want to go back to Burrow for a second. He, he's not in my cash pool, but Burrow is the guy that you kind of talked me into a little bit. And it's it, to me, it's a leverage play. Um, I need to see you know what his ownership percentage is looking like because if I can play a low-owned Burrow, and if I can stack him with a low owned, you know, Chase or Higgins, you know, pick your poison. Um, that to me is very intriguing. Anytime that you can play elite players and gain leverage at the same time, I mean, that's that that's the chance I'm willing to take. You know what I mean? Like, I'd much rather take that chance than, you know, you know, Carson Wentz signs for some team, and you know, they, they you know, their starter gets hurt, and you know. And now you're play, playing cards and wins. Like, that's not the risk I want to take, right? Like, I, I don't – if I, I want leverage with elite players. I mean, one of my rules is play good plays. Like, as simple as it sounds, like, honestly, play good plays. Like, winning at DFS isn't about going and saying, you know what, I just got a feeling that um, that, that Cordell Patterson is going to have a huge week. I, I just right. think Bijan's going to get hurt, 
And, you know, no, that's not that's not how you gain leverage. I mean, sure, you can, but you're just throwing away money. You gain leverage by finding guys that are good, that are going on their own for whatever the reason might be. And I think you can do that this week with Burrow and whoever you want to put them with. They've been so bad. They're, yeah, um, they're due, right? Like, I, I just don't think that offense is going to be that bad all year. I can't I see. Mean, they look better if, in the second half, too. I mean, if, if Burrow goes – he if Burrow threw for 400 yards, three touchdowns on Sunday, and Chase caught 10 for a buck 50 and two touchdowns, would anyone be like, oh, my God? You'd right. just go, oh, all right, they're back. Well, boy, I'd like to be on their side before they're back, right. you know, because once they do that, now people want – no one's afraid to play him next week. You're not getting you're not gaining leverage. This this is probably the only time all year that you're going to be able to do a you know Burrow and Chase stack and not have it. You know I wouldn't even necessarily say be chalky, but to, to be able to gain leverage by doing it. So, um, anyways, we're kind of in the same boat as far as receivers. Um, sorry, running backs are oh my lord, quarterbacks, <laughs> Keith. As far as quarterbacks are concerned, because I'm in the same range. Um, pretty much in general, but specifically here for my cash pool, I've got two guys here listed. I'm really having a hard time um, deciding between the two. Typically, um, when it comes to you know time for this video, I'm pretty locked in at quarterback. But my quarterback this week is actually going to be dependent on what happens around the rest of my lineup because I'm happy with both guys. I'm looking at Russell Wilson, first of all. I feel like a lot of people on the surface – are going to see Russell Wilson's name in my pool. They're going to go, what the fuck, Dave? Like, what? Wh- you realize how bad the Broncos are, right? Well, Wilson has been kind of good for DFS purposes, you know, uh, eighth in the league in passing yards, sixth in quarterbacks points scored. And that's without them really, you know, really having, you know, like a game, you know. Um, Jerry Judy, I, I think, is is he's, he's fully back now. I feel like he's 100% going into week four. So all the pieces that are there. Javante Williams is only getting healthier as well. Um, you know, they're missing Dolchis at tight end, but I, you know, I can say whoopie do to that, right? Um, you mentioned Mims earlier, you know, when you were talking about him. So, I mean, the weapons are there. The matchup is there as well. I, I really like Russell Wilson here, um, you know, as a cash quarterback consideration. Great Anthony deep Richardson. Ball thrower too. And yeah, I mean, that's exactly. why I'm hoping if Mims gets in more games. We saw the Judy touchdown late, you know, in, <clears> in the game last week. And again, they're playing a Chicago team that has given up a ton of big plays already this year. I think they can have some real explosive ones. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll, I'll get more and in, more into my thought process between the two, but um, Anthony Richardson's the other guy. And at first, Anthony Richardson, and I, I'll just be clear, I don't like Anthony Richardson. Like you could watch my 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 video that I did with the plant at the beginning of the season where we covered the Colts, and I said don't touch Anthony Richardson. Now that's from a redraft perspective. Um, for DFS, and I said this last week when I was talking about um, you know the potential of him. Um, as a matter of fact, it was in week two. I'm sorry. He is what you know you call a cheat code, right? Like he's a quarterback that absolutely can run the ball. He's more of a runner at this point than he is a passer. That that's what I call a, a cheat code. A guy who, even if he fails you in the air, can absolutely still get you the points on the ground. I mean, I wrote Justin Fields week after week after week after week after week last year because of this kind of style, right? Um, you know, he he cleared uh concussion protocol today. He's playing in week four. My my really my only concern with Richardson is this. A, he's a little bit more expensive than Russ. So if they were the same price, I would play Richardson. But that's not how DFS works, right? They're not the same price. So he's a little bit more expensive. But even even beyond that, it's are they going to treat him with some kid gloves this week because he's coming off a concussion? I don't know the answer to that question. I think that any news that you hear or see – is probably not anything that you can rely on. You're going to just have to have to go with, you know, your feelings on it. In a nutshell, the way I'm looking at quarterback and cash this week is, like I said, I am going to let the rest of my lineup build itself, if you will, and then we'll see what I have left for cash at the end for quarterback. If I have enough to play Richardson, which I've got a couple lineups already built with different contingencies, you know, based on, you know, what might happen with this guy or what, you know, injuries, whatever. 
but I've got a, a Anthony Richardson lineup that I absolutely love. I've got a Russell Wilson lineup that I absolutely love. It's just a matter of how much money do I have left over at the quarterback position and then go from there. So I don't, ha- I mean, my lean is Russell, honestly, because again, if I can't, if I can't really make up my mind between the two of them, my experience tells me go with the cheaper guy. Like, yeah, he might score a few less points, but he's also going to be cheaper, which allows me to do other things elsewhere. So, you know, when, when in doubt, I usually pay down, but that that's my lean right now at, at quarterback. Um, let's talk running backs here. There, I feel like this is this is a pretty easy week for me for running back. It's going to come down to some injury stuff. Um, but again, that's from a cash perspective, which is typically a lot more straightforward than MME. Um, but what are you thinking this week from a running back perspective, Keith? Well, I mean, again, there's so many good options, especially at wide receiver and quarterback in that 5,000 range. I mean, I'm looking at Christian McCaffrey and going, I saw what Saquon Barkley did versus this Cardinals defense. And I just think CMC is going to have a monster. And he's so steady. I mean, you just kind of know since he's been a 49er that he's going to get 15 to 20 touches. He's probably going to score at least one touchdown, maybe two. And if he catches one of those big ones or busts a big run, now you're talking a monster day where he potentially scores like 25, 30 points. And I just Keith, think, he, he might even throw one. That's right. I mean, he might he, even he, I mean, that's I mean, you can't plan on it, but that's that's the kind of player CMC is. He could throw a touchdown pass and nobody would be like, oh my God, he's like, oh damn it. And then the next question, let me ask you about what do you think? Do you think Miami last week that was just more of situation of the scheme they run? and everything, and the way they torched New England, or does New England's run D have serious issues as they get ready to face Tony Pollard? You're talking about – ask ask me again. You're talking about Miami. Um, no, no, I'm sorry. I was saying, like, was it Miami's scheme <clears throat> was why New England struggled so much? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting my teams mixed up. I'm having a, a, a meltdown here. Um, <laughs> my brain is a little late in the week. But the uh, – so scratch that. Do you like Pollard versus New England just in general? <sighs> That's a tough one. Um, I mean, he is on my list of, of guys. So if you really want a detailed answer, I can give it to you now. Um, or I can yeah, wait. Yeah, exactly. Actually, I, he's somebody that I circled or looked at uh, when I started filling a lot of lineups last night. I kept passing him by, but it kept being one of those deals where, you know, you look at him and go, am I making a big mistake here? Because they the Patriots have not been great against running backs so far this season. So um, Pollard initially stood out to me. Um, at the beginning of the week as a guy that I pretty much, I locked him in with CMC. I said, this is where my running backs are going this week. I'm going CMC. I'm going Pollard. I know I can pay down at running back or at at wide receiver. I know I can pay down at quarterback. I'm definitely paying down at um, defense. I usually pay down at tight end. I had money to spend somewhere. And so he stood out to me. And then I got to thinking, and I was like, man, you know, it's not really the best matchup in the world. Um, I've got so many other guys here that are cheaper that, that I really like. And so Pollard, um, prior to today had fallen off my radar. He's still in the pool, but he no longer was making his way into any of my lineups. And then what happened was then I see Austin Eckler is very possible to play this week. And I had already crossed him off my, off my board. Um, I took, he wasn't even in my cash pool because I didn't think it was worth my time and effort to think about him, write him up, talk about him because he wasn't going to play. So why even bother? But then today I see there's a chance that he might actually play because of probably, you know, Kelly being trash these last couple of weeks. Um, Mike Williams being injured. So now with Eckler being a possibility, now Pollard has really fallen off my radar. So, um, would I play him in cash this week? Absolutely. I mean, he's again being the player pool. Um, but right now, now it would take something to happen for me to get back to him. The first thing that's got to happen is Eckler's got to be out. Um, so we got to start with that, which is extraordinarily possible. Right. Um, then something else has to happen as well. We either another running back that I'm going to talk about is going to not be an option. Um, I don't know, maybe something happens with, with Russ, God forbid, and I have to play Richardson. Now that's a little bit more money I planned on spending. Uh, you know, maybe some, some things happen where players that I'm banking on right now in my pool aren't available, and now I can't afford Pollard. That That's probably the way he gets in. 
So I've really done one of these. I've kind of done a roller coaster on Pollard this week. I just, you know, I think the reason I initially am so afraid to pull the gun on him is just we know Belichick is always going to try to take away whatever you do best first. And yeah. to me, Pollard has become the, you know, the engine of the Cowboys offense. Like, you know, the better he does, the better the offense does. Um, Mostert is a guy that I, I really am interested to see what, uh, his ownership is this week because I think yeah. so many people are going to look at, you know, how do you say it? H A chain, A chain, right? And that how you say the, the uh, he, kid's name? Uh, he changed how his name, how he wants his name to be pronounced. <laughs> I think it was originally A chain, and now he is he has corrected people and he said it's like I I don't even know now. So it's amazing when you rush for two hundred <clears throat> yards and three touchdowns, yeah. you find your voice a little, right? Yeah, I forget uh, what it was he was saying. Oh, by the way, it's not a chain; it's a whatever. I mean, Mostert to me is just a very interesting play. He's been extremely steady. He is the yeah. perfect running back for this offense because we, yes. we've seen they like to go outside. They want running backs that are very fast and they make quick decisions, and that is absolutely what Mostert excels at. And then I know it's, you know, past and every season changes, but Tua's record versus Buffalo, very suspect. Uh, he's not really had any monster games uh, in the passing department versus them. I think he's like one and four, one and five against them. Uh, so I just think that, you know, McDaniels is very smart. He's going to probably come out and try to run the ball. And I think if he's low owned, that's somewhere to look at, but, the guy that I'm really excited about this week is Alvin Kamara being back. Uh, I mean, still no Williams. Looks like Carr is going to be out. We're going to get Winston. Mm -hmm. And yep. we know what happens when Winston has to fling it. Uh, a lot of turnovers and not necessarily the best way to win a game. I think you're going to see Kamara both get plenty of touches as well as be utilized in the passing game. He had a lot of big reception games with Jameis last year. Uh, in Tampa Bay's defense is, I don't know. I'm still not sold on them. I know they've had a couple of good games. You look at the way Philly just gashed them uh, last week. I know that's one of the best offensive lines, but yeah, they gash uh, everybody. But that's yeah. Fair. yeah, yeah. But right, I, I do think that Kamara now, when you have you know several weapons in the passing game that New Orleans does, they didn't have Michael Thomas and Alave. Uh, I don't think both healthy, but one game last year that Kamara played. So. It's just another kind of, you know, close to or borderline elite player on the field at the same time. I think that's going to open up for a little bit, make that Saints. All We're going to get to see what the Saints offense is this week. Even with Winston, I just think they're going to have more options. But the guys I really love this week are Swift. Um, I mean, what can you say? He just – if he gets 10 carries or more in his last eight games, 855 yards, four touchdowns, that the issue in Detroit was they – they just didn't trust him, and for the, season the long, issue issue in Detroit was he was never healthy. Oh no, I I agree, and what I'm <laughs> saying is that's why I didn't trust him. I mean that they were worried he was going to break down if they gave him a lot of carries, which is what happened. <laughs> and if I was a Swift owner in season long, I said this on Shay Thursday, I'd be very concerned about. I his would usage. sell him so fast if I could. I'm a hundred percent with you, but luckily at DFS, <laughs> I only got to worry about this week. Yeah, uh, I mean a, a elite matchup. talent, but man, he's just a ticking time bomb. And uh, we've seen, you know, again, with those giant holes, what he can do. And what's crazy is he really hasn't busted a big, big run for a touchdown. I think that's coming. That could be this week. And then don't laugh at me, but Javante Williams. I love it. Absolutely. Who, again, this Bears team, really bad versus the run. The issue with Javante has been the Broncos have been down. And they haven't – I don't think he's had more than 11 carries in a game yet because – they get down so early, they can't really run it. I think this is the first week that mm. their offense is going to be the better of the two. They're going to have a lead. And he just – I think he's due. I think he's going to score. If you look at his red zone usage and stuff, when they've got there, it's been good. He's still getting those pass uh, attempts. So, I mean, and, you know, DK, you're going to at least have a high floor to him. And he's going to – he scored like eight to ten points each game. He just has had like 40, 50 yards rushing. And then if you're going down, I, I can't trust Damian Pierce. Uh, but Johnson on Chicago is the other guy that just I'm looking at because I think Denver's going to win. And we've seen once the game kind of gets out of hand, it really tilts toward him. He gets the yeah. most receptions. He's the back that's used the most. And I, I really like him as well. No, I love it. I have zero issue with anything that you said, Keith. Um, 
for cash, obviously, I'm looking at a little bit of a different, a little bit of a different profile. You know, looking at a different way. Um, I'm going to start though with CMC. He is absolutely locked in right now for me. I want to basically say the same thing that I said in week two. Here's my thoughts about CMC. Right, death taxes and playing CMC in cash when he's healthy. That that's that's about all you need to know, man. Like there was a point in time where you know CMC gets you know, over like $10,000 on DraftKings and you still just play him. When he's healthy, you play him. Nothing has changed. There, there's nothing that's going to, barring an injury, nothing's going to prevent me from playing CMC this week. So he is locked in. The other guy that I currently have locked in is Kyron Williams. Um, Joe really liked him this week. Did he? So mm-hmm. here, here's the one thing that that I say all the time, and it's maybe a little bit new to you. The concept isn't new. But just hearing me say it over and over again might be a little bit new to you. But volume is king. <laughs> Sound like that's exactly what Joe yeah. said. So volume is Number king. Number one man. in the NFL. Mm-hmm. Yep. Snap so, count. Yep. So to me, it is <clears throat> it's volume over matchup, and that's what keeps Pollard in my lineup. Right. If I had CMC going up against the Titans, because we talked about how much of a of a pass funnel they are. If CMC is healthy, I'm playing him against the Titans in DFS. When I have other options, I just, I just, I absolutely am. The volume is just too much. Kyron Williams, like I said, volume is king. I will say it over and over and over again every week, multiple times on the show. For Ten years from now, um, I mean, like I said, the volume it's as good as it gets. Man, ninety-seven percent snap count, a hundred percent snap count in the last two weeks. Fifth in running back scoring so far this year. I mean, he's got a good price as well. I just, I don't, I don't know how I could not play Kyron Williams in cash. Like to me, it just seems like a no brainer. Um, the guy that I wrote up today and added to my pool, I mentioned him earlier, Austin Eckler. Didn't have him in the initial player pool um, because I was pretty confident he was not going to play. Chargers have a bye week, week five. So it just made sense. You know, he's, he, you know, held him out last week. Um, you know, we hold him out again in week four. He gets week five off, comes back week six, ready to go. Well, Joshua Kelly's been trash. Mike Williams is out for the year. Chargers are 0-3. They drop to 0-4. Yeah, great. Let's bring Eckler back. We're 0-4. I mean, the, the season is is arguably over at that point. So um, I think that there's a decent chance he plays. Um, if he does... If he plays, I'm telling you right now, my running backs are CMC, Eckler, and Kyron, and I go on with my life. Um, when we talk about wide receivers, I, I'll explain how and why that's really possible. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think this is just a situation you have to monitor. If he plays um, and he's not restricted, which if he plays, I don't know why he would be restricted. Um, but, you know, again, cheat code, right? We talked about Anthony Richardson as a cheat code at quarterback because he runs so well. Austin Eckler's a cheat code at running back because he catches the ball so well, right? I mean, it's the same, it's the same thing. That's why I like CMC so much. You know, these are guys who theoretically could go out and get 10 catches, you know, 100 yards. Not to mention what they do in their, you know, in, in their, you know, in their nine to five, you know, on the ground, right? Um, so Eckler's a guy I'm very interested in. He's gonna really be kind of the key, I think. If if Eckler plays, like I said, I'm putting him in, I'm gonna need to save a little bit of money. And that's where I'm going to have to play Russ. Um, if Eckler's not in, I probably don't play Pollard. I probably play somebody else here I'm going to talk about. I then all of a sudden find myself with the money to play Richardson. So this is where I said I kind of – I'm going to let everything else determine my quarterback. Um, Tony Pollard's absolutely in here. We already talked about him. Uh, you know, what I'll say that I didn't say before, volume is king, right? I've said it 712 times this year. Um I'm not a huge fan of the matchup, but again, I would, you know, uh, I'm taking volume over matchup every single time. Zach Moss is the guy that I'm interested in. I have a hard time. I have a hard time really debating on if I play Richardson, if I would play Moss. Um, because I, I feel like even though, you know, volume is, is there for Moss, like, like no, I wouldn't say like nobody else, but it, it nobody's really better. Um, you know, he, you, 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 who don't, who, who knows who's going to get those goal line touches? Who knows who's going to get those touchdowns? You know, um, you could argue that if you have Richardson and Moss, you're kind of locking down all the goal line touches. So no matter who scores, you're going to score. 
but I don't know. I, I a little bit tough there, but you know, through, you know, the two weeks that he started, he has been touching the ball at, at an alarmingly high rate um, on the field, basically every snap getting basically every single touch in that backfield. And, and that's not a, an exaggeration. He literally every snap, every touch is going to, to Moss back there. Um, and he's been very efficient on these touches. You know, you can have guys who get tons of touches. And they don't do a whole lot with them. He, he's been touching the ball. He's been very efficient. Um, you know, the, the price is good I, I, in a perfect world. You know, I would play every one of these guys I just mentioned, but you know, there's a few things, Keith, that, that you always hear me say, you've already heard the one volume is King. That, I say that, right. The other thing I say, you can't play everybody. Right. right. So Zach Moss. Yeah. I would love to play him, but can't play everyone. The other thing that I say, and it may or may not be on this particular show, but Joe gives me a hard time all the time about it. A lot of times when somebody asks me a question, I say, well, it's slate dependent, but because it's not a cop out, it's just true. Like it's slate dependent, you know, like, Hey, do you always play three running backs in cash? It's not a yes or no answer. It's well, it depends. Um, last guy I want to talk about, um, I don't see him making my pool, but I'll talk about how it's possible. And that's Josh Jacobs. Um, probably more of an MME play, but you know, really struggled so far to start off the year. I will say it's a self-inflicted wound. You know, the guy held out up until the last minute. Um, I can't imagine that that didn't play a role in, you know, his struggles here. Um, you know, saw 79% of snaps uh, so far, 90% of the team's rushes, getting a 16% target share. All things that we think of when we think of, you know, Josh Jacobs. You know, lack of volume hasn't been the issue. It's just been his efficiency. Um, and again, volume is king, right? So Josh Jacobs is one of those guys. Um, you know, good matchup against the Chargers as well. Alexander Madison was, you know, DOA coming into to last week, and all of a sudden he's back on the map because the Chargers, you know, run defense sucks. So I think that, you know, Jacobs is in play if, if Eckler is out. First of all, you need Eckler to be out. Second, you need to not want to play Pollard. You've got to be, you know, out on Pollard, and you still want to pay up at running back. And I think that's where Jacobs becomes an option. But, you know, I I don't see myself personally playing him, but um, I do like to mention guys, you know, that I think are cash viable um, because if I just sat there and, you know, only talked about the guys that I was playing, this would be a short show. We talk about nine guys, we go on with our life. People need a little bit more information. So um, I do like to talk about, Guys, that even though I'm not playing, I could see, you know, somebody, you know, choosing to go that route. Um, wide receivers, man. Th- this is where. Man, what a fruitful is, week. This is where, yeah, you don't normally get this um, kind of a scenario for for wide receivers. So I have a feeling we're going to talk about a whole bunch of the same guys. <laughs> I hope, I hope that one guy that just made my player pool today is a guy that you go, oh, and you write down, and it and it changes your week for the better. But well, spoiler me... warning, I'm I'm writing down every name that you're basically saying. <laughs> you're well, like, you're gonna... over here, I'm getting inside information, so why not? But I have a feeling. I don't know. We'll see. I just know enough about you that I feel like this guy is not necessarily off your radar, but I feel like he's kind of off of everyone's radar. So um, I'm hearing that. What do you What do you think about wide receiver keys this week? I mean, I. Again, it's I'm not going to crap on anybody for wanting to take Tyreek or Jefferson. I mean, you look at, again, the volume and stuff, but it's it's not a great matchup. Uh, but again, if that's, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. I just think this week the running back is a position you should be spending on because I think agree. there's values in QBs and receivers this week. Uh, but when you get down to Keenan – I'm having a hard time not saying, okay, you just talked about volume being king. Nine targets week one, 10 targets week two, 20 targets week three. Yeah. And now no Marvin Williams. I mean, excuse me, Mike Williams, like, I just can't believe he's not going to get at least 15 targets. Like, at least. I mean, we could again see him hit 20 targets in this game. I know you may say, well, what happens if they, they single in on him? I've seen the Raiders play defense. I don't think they're able to single in on anybody. Uh, and Herbert's just a really good quarterback. And I I think Kellen Moore's a really good coordinator. So 
I think they're going to find ways to get him the ball. I'm really mad at myself that it took me this long. Uh, I think it was like week two to really think about he's in the CD lamb role now and what that means. And I would have scooped him up in every season, every season league uh, for where he went, but that's on me. I've, I've talked a little bit about the chase and, you know, Higgins. Yeah. If you're doing bigger contests, I would definitely do the the, the triple stack with them. Run both yeah, receivers with Burrow. Just gonna say, don't hesitate to to run the double stack out there. I have, you know, I'm gonna pull up ownership real quick while you're talking. I just yeah. want to see, I want to see how viable they are. So go ahead. Um, I just want to look at ownership and see real quick what that looks like. And then the my single game stack this week, especially on DraftKings, was from the Colts and the Rams. And it's the two Rams top receivers, Puka and Tutu, with Michael Pittman. And, again, you're talking about volume. Uh, those two receivers are right now receiving Tutu and Puka over 50% of Stafford's targets and over 60% of his completions. And what I really like about it is this is the last week you're going to have a value with this Rams team because once Cooper Cup comes back, a, the target's going to, you know, shift. Like, obviously, Cup's going to be heavily involved. We won't know immediately which one of the other two receivers is going to take a big hit. I think they both are going to take a little bit of a hit. But we know Cup's also going to be much more expensive. I don't. I, I would be shocked if Cup, you know, even his first week is not 7,500 or above with what he's done historically and just who he is. So I love being able to play both of those guys, again, against a Colts team that has given up a ton of, ton of, passing yards, touchdowns, et cetera. And then Michael Pittman, I'm very excited that Richardson is back because right now he's played a ha- basically a game and a half. Just over 30% of his throws have gone to Michael Pittman. Pittman has been very consistent. Obviously, you got to worry about the, you know, the touchdowns because he's yet to catch one this year. Or maybe yeah, I think he did have one week one. But um, I, I, I just think that that combo right there, you're making me kind of lean to maybe I'll play it hope that that game gets a little higher scoring and Richardson has the monster game. And then even if Pittman does what he's done in the weeks, I mean, his lowest game is 13.6 points at 6,500. That's not going to kill you, but he's already had 23.7 game, which that was his only full game with Anthony Richardson. Um, And then the value again, to me, there's other good plays above it, but you get down to again, two, two Jacoby Myers, it is yeah. unbelievable what is going on with Myers in Oakland. He's another guy that I didn't think he was that good. He is. He's playing with Devontae Adams and putting up huge numbers. Over the last two weeks, 92% of the first reads have either gone to Devontae Adams or Jacoby Myers. So they're making them kind of a 1A, 1B uh, when it comes to priority for Jimmy G. You've seen that. Both of those guys, Tutu and Jacoby are averaging 17.8 and 22.3 points on DK. You look at their cost compared to, I think you can go up almost $1,000 before you get a receiver Mm -hmm. that is averaging more points than both of them. So obviously that is value. I talked about Mims, who I really like. I like the stack again of Tank Dell, Stroud, and Nico Collins. Uh, Dell is, I mean – Another guy that a lot of hype coming into this season. And I was like, ah, it's it's not real. It's the Texans. CJ Stroud's not going to be that good. Yeah, I screwed up there. But mm. I have been hammering Tank Dell in lineup since week one. Yeah. And he just keeps getting more and more volume. If you look at his first read targets, it was like 15% week one, 23% week two, 31% week three, a week three, a 22% target share the last two weeks. And we know this offense is throwing it 40 times a game. So, again, there's plenty to feed both Collins and Dell. They're both, you know, very reasonably priced. And I do like Collins this week because he had a bad game last week, and I think everybody's going to kind of jump off of him. But he's got a good matchup. Pittsburgh has struggled. I do have a little concern about, you know, Houston's offensive line against Pittsburgh's defensive front. I heard on the Bill Simmons show today that, it's uh they're honoring JJ Watt. So now I know TJ Watt's gonna have at least four sacks in that yeah. game for his yeah. brother, uh, and probably wreak havoc. But I still think they throw enough that that's a good value. And then Elijah Moore's another guy that I really like this week, kind of in that 47. He's just a little bit more expensive than Tank Dell, I believe, on both sites. But his volume continues to go up. If you believe that Watson I don't want to say got right last week, but that was the most Deshaun Watson from the Houston Texans I had seen out of him since he's been in a Cleveland Brown uniform. 
I think they're slowly figuring out that they're going to have to throw more, obviously, with Nick Chubb being out. And just, again, more getting a huge volume. What is it? Through three games, he's hitting at least seven targets, back-to-back -back weeks of nine targets. So I think he's a discount as well. And then Marvin Mims, I'm playing – uh, in any lineup, obviously, that I have Russell Wilson, because why not? Russell's one of the best deep throwers in the NFL. Mm. He has been for a long time. And this guy, seven targets, turned it into almost 200 yards receiving. It's unbelievable. Uh, I think he's at over eight yards per route right now on the season. I just think if you're going to play him, you know, this could be the week, A, that is, he sees a significant increase in his snaps, his routes, et cetera. But let's say it's, it's not his week, and – Chicago, again, gives up a ton of big plays. He can get one to three targets and turn it into a 50-yard touchdown. Mm -hmm. He's proven twice this year he can run, return kickoffs back for a touchdown. And the guy's still in the 3,000 range on DraftKings. So I love that. It gives you so much flexibility with the rest of your lineup where if you want to spend up on running back, defense, you have options. You know, I could go – a half hour just based on what you just said and expand on it. But obviously I, I won't because I can't do that. Um, I will go back though. I said I was going to look up the ownership for the Bengals. Okay. I've got some good news and I've got some bad uh -oh. news. What do, what do you want first? Give me the, give me the good news. The good news is um, <clears throat> both Burrow and T Higgins are looking to be drawing next to no ownership. Um, I mean, God, if I were to scroll, well, let's do, let me let me see how far I had to even scroll down before I get into the tier that Burrow is in. Um, so Richardson's looking like you know the highest ownership by quite a bit, and then we got a whole handful of guys in the next tier of like five to ten percent. Um, then we get down to like the under five percent guys, right? So even if you were to put Burrow at the top of the under five percent guys, there's still one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten guys. So probably best case scenario, he comes in 11th in ownership for a guy who could be the best quarterback on the slate, arguably. I mean, you could – it would be a shock if he had 40 points this week, you know. Um, and then T. Higgins is, you know, God only knows how far – he was way down in that, again, under 5% range. Which so again, just seven receptions. I said this already on the show Thursday. He had seven receptions twice against the Titans last year, once with Jamar Chase, and then again in the playoff game uh, last January. Yeah, so even even just going that route, even if you just went ahead and did, you know, Burrow and T, you're, you're already, you know, gaining some leverage there. And one thing that I always talk about whenever I'm building MME lineups is, you know, in large or small field, either way, a minimum of two guys – that are going to be 5% or less. It just, that's the way you differentiate yourself, right? When you get into the bigger fields, then I bump it up to at least two still, but probably a third. I don't know if I would necessarily go a fourth, but it depends on, on your guys, right? In this situation, if Burrow and Higgins are two of your four guys, I Try could to argue to more. say, yeah. You, yeah, if you were like a couple of the guys that you like that were leverage plays, that would be where I could see going four guys. Um, but, but two is the absolute minimum. So you can get them right there. The bad news would be, um, the ownership for chase. So under 8k, everybody's like, Hey, look at this. <laughs> yeah. So chase is looking right now. He's at the top of the second tier. So he's going to be a top five owned receiver this week. So, um, now that doesn't mean you still couldn't go, you know, burrow chase Higgins. It just means that, you know, the people that play chase are probably playing burrow. You're going to share so, yeah. So if you want to get if you want to get different, you, you really need to like pump Drew Sample or something in there. You need you know? to be sure he's going nuts, um, right? If you're committing yeah. to that play, I yeah, feel very good about it. I should say. I know we're yeah, not sure about yeah. it. Yeah, I think I think your best bet on a Burrow stack is to go Higgins. Burrow and Higgins, and kind of hope that it's a Higgins day, right? Because Higgins easily could go for oh yeah ten a buck fifty and two touchdowns himself, and if Chase has. Five catches for 60 yards, no touchdown. Now you're golden. So right. um, another thing I want to mention, you were talking about um, Anthony Richardson earlier, talking about stacking him with Pittman and whatnot, um, especially now that I see that Richardson is probably going to be the highest owned quarterback on the slate. I feel like you, I don't feel like, I know that you need to get unique there as well. So let me present you with two options. The first one is obvious. The second one, is 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 a milli type play in my opinion. Um, first one, you just play him naked. You just run him out there. You don't stack him. You don't correlate anything. You just go, hey, 
you know, he's going to throw for only 200 yards, but he's going to run the ball in twice and give you 70 yards on the ground. Play him naked. The other option is you 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 stack him and you correlate him in a unique way. So by all means, throw throw Pittman in there with him. No no problem. But then maybe you throw Zach Moss in there as well. Now you've pretty much locked up every touchdown that the Colts are you know likely going to get. You got Richardson, you got Moss, you got all the touchdowns on the ground. You got Pittman for what's left to go in the air. I would also throw in like a Kylan Granson if you wanted to go Granson and Pittman. That gets you unique. But I don't see a lot of people going Richardson, Pittman, and Moss. And if they put up points because they've been playing at a very, very fast pace this year, a lot of no huddle. Um, so you could see them making a, a pretty solid game environment. And so I just want to put out the suggestion for, you know, a milli stack of Richardson, Pittman, and Moss. I you're playing good players, right? And, and you're, Great you know, play and, caller who knows how to yeah. use his best yeah. weapons. That's why Pittman, I think, is doing yeah. so much better this year. So, so just th- those are just some of my thoughts on what you said. I just, I just felt like I could add to it a little bit as well. Um, you did not mention my. I don't know if it's even outside of the box because I noticed his ownership is is higher than you would expect. But you didn't mention him, so I will get to him. You also mentioned. You also didn't mention another guy who I think is an extreme value. Um, who's Thielen. locked in? There you go. Locked into my cash lineup. <laughs> I forgot about him. To be yep. Honest. So he was said on a Thursday, but I did forget. So about him I here. like to go in order of basically my preference right. on these guys. Okay. Oh, okay. Perfect. So I start with uh, two guys I have locked in. We we've talked about Tank Dell already. Tank Dell to me is absolutely locked in. This is a guy. Week one was you know minimum salary. He's working his way up. He's you know certainly nowhere near cost prohibitive yet. But another solid week, and we might start getting to the point where he's not that salary saver we can just plop in um, and cash. You know, um, volume's been good. I said, you know, coming into week three that the volume probably wouldn't be as good as it was in week two, and it kind of wasn't to some extent. Um, but the efficiency was so much better. So he had less opportunity, but did more with it in week three. So he's shown you that he can get it done because of volume. He showed you he can get it done because of efficiency. So he, to me, is a no-brainer in cash. Adam Thielen, um, again, another guy who, you know, the salary just makes sense. I love what you had said earlier, because you did mention Thielen at one point earlier, and you said my first thought, revenge game narrative, right? I honestly feel like that's not a hyperbole. I feel like that Mm -hmm. is legitimate. I really think that, I mean, that is something that I truly find myself not reaching for, but gravitating towards. Um, so great Can you imagine spot if here. the Panthers <clears throat> win a game before the Vikings and Adam Thielen's a big reason <clears throat> for it. Wow. And it, and it could be too, right? I mean, you know, he's locked into my cash lineup, so I'm hoping so. Um, you know, but there, there's always going to be expensive guys that we want to play. And guys like Tank Dale, guys like Adam Thielen are what can, you know, help to make that happen. You know, price is phenomenal. Volume's been there the last couple of weeks. Um, it's kind of looked like 2018, you know, Adam mm-hmm. Thielen here. So I'm saying play tank and Thielen, move on with your life. Um, Josh Palmer is another guy here. Um, surprised he didn't get priced up more. Um, I, you know, I guess. On DK, right? Uh, 4K. I think that's yep. right. Because I was shocked it was so yeah. low. Yeah. Um, so that was my first thought was, well, I'm surprised he didn't get priced up more. And then I thought to myself, well, he hasn't really earned he hasn't really earned a higher salary. Like he hasn't, he had a slow start to the season. So we're not playing Josh Palmer for the same reason we're playing Tank Dell. You know, we're playing Josh Palmer because, you know, we at least thought Eckler was going to be out. He still might be. We know Mike Williams is out. Um, So again, here's just a salary saving guy. You know, if Eckler's in, a Palmer for me is out. Um, and the next guy that I name is the reason why I can do that now. I couldn't do that before. Before it was looking like Eckler and Palmer were necessary. It looked like I needed to go Dell, Thieland, and Palmer to be able to play CMC and like a Pollard or something. And um, but you know, I, I don't know. We'll see what happens with Eckler. Um, the guy that I'm excited about, and I don't even know if I'm gonna play him, but Kelvin Austin. Ooh. Came into my radar earlier today. Um, super cheap, thirty three hundred dollars on DraftKings. So if you think that Palmer, Thielen, and Dell are cheap, <laughs> Austin is the cheap guy. 
Um, you know, like I said, there already were plenty of, you know, wide receiver options that were cheap for us to play. And now this guy has popped into the radar. Um, you know, cheapest of the bunch here, but obviously he comes with the most question marks by far. Thing to keep an eye on as far as I'm concerned with Austin really comes down to Allen Robinson. If Allen Robinson is out, I find it maybe impossible not to play Calvin Austin in cash. Um, I don't necessarily think that Allen Robinson will be out, but he has been limited at practice this week. Um, so, you know, even if Robinson is active, um, even if he's limited, then I think that Austin only becomes an option if you've got guys that you just feel like, man, I got to play. So, you know, if you're saying to yourself, hey, Eckler's in, I'm playing him. CMC's in, I'm playing him. I love Richardson. I got to play him over Russell Wilson. And I've got to play a combination. I've got to play one of Tyreek, Jefferson, Adams, you know, Diggs, um, Jamar Chase, Keenan Allen. I mean, you know, if you want to if you want to jam all those guys in because you're just that confident in them, then I think Austin comes into play. But um, for me, it really just depends on the Allen Robinson news. And that's the way it's been for me all year for cash. I've been playing a lot of Luke Musgrave. I've been playing a lot of Jaden Reed. And that only comes into play when I know that Christian Watson's out. So I have lineups built with the contingency that says, all right, Watson's out. This is my lineup. I can play these guys. Watson's in. I can't play those guys. This is where I'm going. And so right now I've kind of got the same thing going on, but it's revolving around Austin Eckler. If Eckler's in, this is what I'm doing. If Eckler's out, this is what I'm doing. Um, And that's why I tell people as well, you know, early in the week, just kind of look at, you know, look at players, you know, kind of get an idea of salaries. Um, You know, you can kind of build some stuff if you want to, not for the reason of actually planning on necessarily playing those lineups, but just seeing how guys mesh together salary wise, because once you get to, um, you know, Saturday, now we've been through Friday practice, which is the most important practice in the NFL by a mile. Now we can really start to get a feel for, okay, who's playing, who's not playing. So if you're out there on Tuesday, Wednesday, hardcore trying to build lineups, I'm telling you, you're wasting your time. You just need to simply be doing research, getting guys on your radar, getting your player pool locked down. And then once you actually know, you know, who's playing and who's not, or at least get a really good feel for it, then you can start building and putting the pieces together. But don't be wasting time Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, even Friday, building lineups whenever you should just be simply doing your research and getting you know, as much knowledge about the week as you can. And then once the puzzle kind of comes together, now you can fit it to, you know, put put the pieces together. Um, So that's my Calvin Austin spiel. Uh, Tyreek Hill, I'll just simply say, I don't know how you don't consider him, right? I'm not saying I'm playing him. I'm not saying you should play him. I'm just saying when he's healthy and this offense is running the way it is, he's got to at least be somebody that you're thinking about. Devontae Adams. Here's how I'm going to recap Devontae Adams week three. Wow. That's my recap from Devontae Adams week three. Wow. Absolutely an elite receiver, right? We No arguments are going to be made there. Um, he's significantly cheaper than Jefferson or Hill if you're looking to pay up at receiver. Um, cheaper, but with very similar upside. And the matchup is phenomenal, right? So Devontae Adams was a guy who early in the week Chalk him up, lock him into my cash lineup. Now we don't know if Jimmy G's playing. So Devontae Adams is definitely in my player pool. If Jimmy G is healthy, if Jimmy G is out, then I I have many other options that I have interest in playing. I don't need to force Devontae Adams in. Keenan Allen, you talked about him quite a bit. Um, I honestly don't care if Eckler plays or not. Um, I feel the same about Allen. A lot of times you would say, well, wouldn't we want other people to be missing so he gets more opportunity? Well, maybe, but then that also means the defense is going to be even more honed in on him, right? So to some extent, I'd almost rather Eckler was on the field. But at the same time, if Eckler's out, you know, it's not like a direct relation between the two players, you know. Um, so I would rather Eckler played. But at the end of the day, it, there's no bearing there for me on what I'm doing with Keenan Allen. Keenan Allen simply comes down to, do I want to allocate the money at that position or not? And if I do, do I like him better than I like the other big names? He's cheaper than, you know, the other names, basically. It's just a matter of what you want to do. And then Jamar Chase, we kind of talked about him a little bit as well. Going to be super popular. 
um, in an absolutely fantastic spot. For cash purposes, it's crazy to say that I don't really trust Chase, but that's kind of where we are. Um, if I'm paying up at receiver, you know how much Chase is. Um, He's 78, so I think 7,800 on DK. 70 on DK. So basically the same price as Allen, basically the same price as Devontae, significantly cheaper than Tyreek and Jefferson. Um, I'm probably not spending that amount of money and a receiver in cash because all the names I, I popped off early on where I can save a ton of money because I am prioritizing running back this week. I'm playing CMC, period. If Eckler is in, I'm playing Eckler. I've already told you I'm playing Kyron Williams. Um, so I don't see myself getting the chase, but very similar to the Josh Jacobs you know, pick earlier, he's in the pool because I think that he is absolutely cash viable. Just because I'm not necessarily finding a way to get him into my lineup doesn't mean that you don't have pieces, you know, within this pool that, you know, you feel like you can play and that you like and and Chase becomes a part of that. So um, we're almost coming up to an hour, Keith. We're just sitting here going to town. Having a good time. Great information. Having a great time. I know we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on defense, but I think tight end is a little bit interesting this week. I don't have many names to get to. But I think it's an interesting conversation. Love to hear what you're thinking about tight end this week. So this is a week that I am strongly considering, especially if Eckler's out, take one of the Chargers tight ends, whether it be Everett, if you're looking for just maybe a higher floor, or Parham, if you're looking for a higher ceiling. Because uh, both of them are going to see an increase in targets, especially, again, if Eckler's out. If Eckler plays – if I was going to play one, I would probably be Everett uh, just because I think that if you look at it, he just, he, he gets a lot more targets. Parham's caught two touchdowns, still barely average. I yeah. think like maybe a point or two more per game. Uh, but the guys I'm playing in most lineups this week, Pat Fryermuth, uh finally got involved. It looks like again, Robinson, we know Johnson's out. That's very good for Fryermuth in a very good matchup indoors to Fryermuth's a fast tight end. Um, the other guy I'm really looking at is Logan Thomas of Washington. Okay. Um, I've been he's been in my lineup every week that he's been available, weeks one, two, and now four. I just the enemy loves to throw to tight ends. He loves to throw to tight ends. That's very evident by the fact that I think uh, Logan has like 11 targets in basically six quarters. He got hurt uh, in the second quarter of week two. He already had two receptions, 20 yards, and a touchdown in that game. Um, I just think he's very safe, and Philly is right now dead last versus tight ends. And it's not like they've played a murder's row of tight ends. No offense to Hunter Henry, no offense to mm-hmm. you know Dallas Scott, any of the guys that they. I, I'm they, gonna get texts from the Goddard family now. Thanks, Keith. I, I'm sorry. I, again, <clears throat> it is what it is. The other guy just maybe to consider. Jawan Johnson has kind of been an afterthought in the New Orleans offense, and. A lot of it last year was he was catching big plays that would turn and touch. Ironically, I'll, I'll be full discretion. It was more with Dalton than it was with Winston. But we know Winston also likes to really push it down the field. If you're in a bigger tournament, I don't hate that against Tampa, who has also had some issues with tight ends earlier this year. But this is a week that really I'm probably going with Friar or Logan Thomas in a majority of my lineups. So I will tell you that um, you did – it's very rare. You can ask Garrett. I don't know if Garrett's going to watch this or not, but you can ask Garrett. Very rare that somebody talks me into making a change with my player pool. Um, Logan Thomas initially was out of my player pool um, because I was concerned about um, I was concerned about him playing and if it was going to be in a limited fashion. When you mentioned Logan Thomas, I thought to myself, oh, let me go check real quick and let me go see. Logan Thomas, as of Thursday, has already practiced fully. So he is off. He is he is completely on the radar now. Um, I probably am not going to play him because I'm really in on two guys, one of which you mentioned, one of which you did not. Um, but Logan Thomas now is back in my player pool. I'm actually going to write him up, put him in the Discord, um, just for people to have that information. Um, because now I consider him way more viable than the two guys that I'll start off with talking about um, just because the other two guys are the guys I'm probably going to play. But um, I already talked about Kylan Granson. Um, you know, I pretty much exclusively punt at tight end. Very, very rarely do I ever pay up. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a, in a second. But very rarely do I pay up. I almost always punt. I very, very rarely do a mid-price tight end either. It's usually somebody low-priced. 
So Kyle and Granson, do I love them? Nope, sure don't. Um, but there hardly ever is a good punt tight end option, right? There, there's something wrong with with every one of those guys. That's why they're so you know cheap. But when Granson's on the field, he's running routes. That that's what I want. I want guys who are going to run routes. You know, whatever happens, happens. But I at least want him to run the damn route, right? They can't catch the ball if they're not you know running the route. His snap share, um, you know, the percentage is not amazing, but it's adequate. Could always pair him with Richardson, especially in, like I mentioned earlier in MME. Um, so he, he's a guy that, you know, I just want to mention, uh, you already talked about Donald Parham, um, you know, kind of a trickle down effect here for Mike Williams. He scored a touchdown in two of the last three weeks. Um, you know, again, he, he's, he's a punt option. That's what I like to do. Um, when I do play the punt guys, usually I gravitate towards touchdown upside because if they get, and I tell Chris this all the time, if my punt tight end gets me one catch for one yard and it's a touchdown, I would sign up for that every single time. If you told me right now he was going to get 7.1 points, I would run. I'm happy, right? Um, then the two guys I'm actually interested in playing, right? I'm going to start off with George Kittle. You know, as the week has gone on, I just have been finding myself gravitating more and more towards Kittle. Um, like I said, I rarely, rarely do anything but punt at tight end. Has to just be that perfect storm for me to pay way up at tight end. Now, Kittle is not necessarily going all the way up, you know, like a, like a Kelsey would be. Um, but, you know, I, I still hate those mid-price tight ends. Um, a super strong preference to punt. I've said that 27 times just in this little spot here. So again, I, I punt a tight end, right? But all that being said, Kittle just absolute smash spot here against the Cardinals, you know, notoriously the worst by far team against tight ends. When you think about how poor the Titans are against receivers, that's the Cardinals. I'm sorry, Kelly Singh, but that's the Cardinals against the tight end. It's just terrible, right? What, what makes this possible really comes down to I can play three, I can play four cheap wide receivers on this slate. And that's what allows me to make this happen. That's not normally the case. Kittle would normally not even be a consideration, but guys like Tank Dell, Adam Thielen, Calvin Austin, um, Josh Palmer, those guys make it possible here. Um, criteria, Keith, and you're going to want to write this down. Criteria for me paying up a tight end, right? There's two criteria that I have to consider. They have to meet one of the two. Number one, are they dating Taylor Swift? <laughs> Kittle is not dating Taylor Swift, so he does not qualify there. Number two, are they in an absolutely perfect situation, meaning just the, the matchup is phenomenal and they're an elite player? Kittle meets the second criteria. And just as a note, I do not have a problem whatsoever with playing CMC and Kittle together in the same lineup. Um, so probably playing Kittle this week as crazy as that is because I I never do that. It might be three years before I pay that much for a tight end again. Other guy I'll talk about, you mentioned him, Pat Fryermuth. You know, don't really like playing those mid-price tight ends, and he is just about there. But damn it, I did it last week. Um, I, I paid up for Zach Ertz last week. Didn't work out. Shocker. Um, and that's why I don't usually do it. But, you know, <laughs> didn't work out last week. Here we are looking at it again. You know, I did not learn my lesson, Keith. Um, shoot or shoot, Dave. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess that's what I'm doing here. But the tight end options this week, honestly, they just suck. And they usually suck, but they really suck this week. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it comes down to I'm probably playing Kill or I'm probably playing Frymuth. It really just depends. Same thing as a quarterback. It really just depends on how it, how it plays itself out. My current lineup, though, that if everything is status quo as it stands now, like I said, it has Russ in it and also has Kittle in it. Um, everyone's favorite part. This is the part that I make sure and highlight the most, the defense and special teams. I heard Chris giving me a hard time last week when you were covering for me while I was in New Orleans. Heard him giving me a hard time about talking about defense too much. I say tough shit because defense, <laughs> defense is important, man. Um, it really is. And – I'm going to let you lead the way here. I'm going to let you talk as much or as little about defense as you want. I don't have a whole lot here. It's pretty straightforward for me, but would be really curious to hear not only your thoughts on the position, but your thoughts on the position for this week. I am uh, more towards Chris in the sense that I immediately look under 3,000 
and yep. try to find my best defense in that Absolutely range. Absolutely right. Now, I will say, though, if it happens that I have, say, I don't know, eight dollars $900 left over, uh, you know, when I kind of get my core guys in there, then I start looking, does it make more sense to pay up, you know, receiver? And very rarely is the defense, but every once in a while, like week one uh, with the Cowboys, I did it and it paid off gangbusters. So it just depends on the matchup. But uh, this week, there's two in the 3,000 range that, again, if you have the money, I'm not against. One is the Saints at home versus Tampa. This is a very good defense. Uh, we saw last week what happens to Philly, or excuse me, what, to Tampa's offense when they play a team that can pass rush, which New Orleans can absolutely do, and has – a good secondary New Orleans right now, probably the best corners in the NFL, at least by like PFF grades, pass deflections, those kind of things. The one that might surprise you is the Denver Broncos. I mean, the bears yeah. are a mess. They turn it over. And if you're asking me, is there a team that I could see the game getting out of hand and Fields is in a situation where he's having to throw, I know I gave him this one of my quarterback plays, but I could see Denver, you know what I'm saying, Shh, kind of reminding everyone we're not the as bad as the 70-point defense that we saw. They're also going to be very motivated this week. But yeah, the that's defense part of, is, that's part of my Russ play too, right? Is yep. They, they, they probably are going to be one of two things. Now, it could be in the middle, but they're either, in my opinion, going to be completely deflated, just you know, pissed off at each other and just come out and throw an absolute dud. Or they're going to be highly motivated, completely embarrassed, come out and just take the Bears to the woodshed. I feel like you are going to get one of those two extremes. The other is the Cleveland Browns, who is who I will be using in like 95% of my lineups this week. I mean, how disrespectful. $2,800. I understand they're playing Baltimore. Baltimore's <clears throat> offensive line's banged up. Uh, they can't really run the ball, which I think is going to be a key to really being able to do anything versus clear. They haven't even given up two, 10 first downs in a game yet. Uh, this is a, I think, a legit scary defense. It has the potential to be yes. one of those special defensive years. And I can't believe they're 2,800 at home. That Cleveland fan base mm. is going to be crazy uh, for that game. The Browns are the team that I keep going back to over and over again. So um, I say this every week, and, you know, I like to say it because, A, I know we have a lot of people who watch every single week because, you know, they're smart. They like to win money. But I also know that we've got people who are going to be seeing this for the first time, you know. Um, and I, you and I, this is the first time we've ever, you know, been together here on the show as well. Um, so I always like to start off by saying this, right? I have a completely different mindset for cash than I do for MME. In cash, I'm pretty much playing the, the defense that ends up being the chalk defense because they're going to be in a good matchup. They're going to be cheap. That's the Cleveland Browns. I have locked Cleveland Browns in for cash. They were locked in on cash on Tuesday when I first looked at things. The fact that, you know, the Ravens are either going to be missing, you know, some of their um, playmakers on offense, um, or at least they're going to have guys who are limited, just adds to the fact that there's no chance in the world I don't play Cleveland. Um, with that being said, an MME, Cleveland would be taken directly out of my pool. I would not even remotely consider playing Cleveland in, in MME. I absolutely avoid the cash defense or the, the chalk defense in MME, period. I will never, ever, ever play them because do there you is... look at the whole board in those, or do you just look who is the like say the five or six lowest owned defenses and then try to pick one from there? If there is one or two that just stand out above the rest, they are out of my player pool. There's zero consideration. You couldn't pay me to play them. Um, this week, that is the Cleveland Browns. Um, last week, it was the Bills. Um, now, sometimes it does pay off. I mean, the Bills scored, what, 30-some-odd right, points? points? Yeah. So, yeah, you probably needed to have the Bills, but that's that's honestly not usually the way it works. Right. Um, you know, there was one time that I paid up for a chalk defense, and I mean paid up, and that was last year. It was the Cowboys against the Texans. Cowboys were like seventeen point favorites. Their defense was just killing it. Um, the you know I, I don't even I think Davis Mills was injured as well. So I mean there was just nothing going on for the Texans. And I thought, geez, this is the one week 
where I just, and they were like 5K on DraftKings. And I was like, this is the one time where an MME, I just feel like I've got to play. I just got to play. I'm like, they're, it's like the tight end thing with me paying up a tight end. It's like, this is just a perfect storm. I feel like I'm going to be behind the eight ball if I don't play them. So I played them. They absolutely fucking sucked. I, I pissed away. Game. I pissed away all that money. I could have played anybody else. <laughs> and I, and so I said, that is the last time that that's exactly that just never, ever again, that the defensive position is the most volatile by a mile. Um, there's really salary. No, nothing really correlates to performance. You are just taking a stab at what's going to happen. So like you said, on DraftKings, my my research basically starts at three thousand dollars and works its way down um, for cash. And MME, that's a whole different story. I I don't mind paying up um, and playing a defense because th- for me, defense just becomes a leverage spot. I just want to be unique, so I will never play the Browns, the other team that I'll give you just because I feel like it's it's I'm doing people a disjustice by just giving you a single name and saying, hey, I'm playing the Browns, so are you. I feel like I want to give another option. So I'll say the Panthers. Um, If I look at the Panthers, they are going to be right in the next tier down. There's about five or six teams in the next tier down. So probably wouldn't play them in MME either. But that's that's kind of my thought process on, on defense just as a whole. And then my thought process for this week in particular. Do you? What about Buffalo at home? Miami, like for bigger contests. I'll be honest with you. I'll look real quick. Um, I have been, it has been the Browns and I really haven't looked at much else because I have been looking for cash. Um, Bills against Miami. Boy, oh boy. Um, let's look at their ownership real quick. Uh, they're actually pretty high. Um, wow. They are going to be, so best case scenario, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So they're going to be one of the probably top teams um, in that 5% and below range. Um, for MME purposes, I don't hate it. They're they're not expensive. They are providing a good value if I just look at it from a value perspective. So projected points, you know, in salary, they come up as the third best value. Um, the Browns are number one by a mile. The Raiders are number two. And then you've kind of got a tie between the Bears, Bills, and Panthers for number three. So from an MME perspective, yeah, who's going to want to touch the Bills going up against the Dolphins who just absolutely obliterated the Bears? You know, Bills have a good defense. Um, I don't think that that's a you know big surprise to anybody. Miami typically has struggled on the road with, with Tua. I mean, Tyreek Hill traditionally has had very drastic splits between home and road. Tua has as well. So, yeah, I love the Bears from an MME perspective. Would I trust them in cash? Absolutely not, right? I feel like they've got a wide range of outcomes. They could score 20 points. They could score negative 10, you know. Um, but that's fine. I, I like that from an MME perspective. So, great, Perfect. great, great question. Well, I think we did it, right? Yeah. Hour and, we're going to be in and under an hour and 15. So, the, these are shows that I always tell Chris – I don't have a time limit on because I want to give as much information as we really can. This is the only show that we do other than obviously Sundays at noon. We go live with, hey, we have inactives. We can give you our, our final thoughts now because there is no exactly we're going to play. Right. Is Alan Robbins is going to play. Is Anthony Richardson has he gotten out of you know concussion protocol? So that's more of a show of this is what I'm doing. This is a show, a little bit of game theory. A little bit of this is what I like. We can throw out a whole bunch of different names. The last thing I want to do is for someone who's willing to give, you know, 45 minutes or more of their time, if you're willing to give 45 minutes because you want to hear what we have to say, I don't think you're going to be too mad if we do another 20 and give you more of what we're, we're going to say. So um, I love know. the thought process. Uh, that's something me and Joe try to do is, you, yeah. know, you know, explain why do we do it. And yeah. hopefully, you know, people learn. And I just believe as you learn stuff, you're going to get better at it. Exactly. And uh, you've had a ton of success. So, you know, obviously like a sponge, just soak that shit up. And, and that's what the, you know, all access members in our private discord talk about, right? They love the fact that not only do I give them a cash pool, but right now I've got four pages worth of notes in word that I posted in, in our, in our discord, right. With my pool, not only does it give you the guys, 
it gives you my exact logic, right? That might be, you know, uh, there's like a paragraph or more per guy, you know, because like one of the members said, you know, yes, I know you're successful. Obviously, I could just follow along with what you do because I've won three weeks in a row. I've doubled my money. Everything's going great. But he's like, I also want you to teach me how to fish. You know what I mean? Like, don't just feed me. Right. Teach me how to fish. And I said, absolutely. That's what I'm here for. I could sit there and say, all right, listen, I'm playing Russell Wilson at quarterback. Go ahead and put him with CMC, Kyron Williams. Go ahead and play Ackler for receivers. I want you to go ahead and play, play Dell, play Thielen. Um, play Josh Palmer. We're gonna put Kittle in at tight end and with the with the Browns. All right, guys. And they go out, they win money. That's great. But what have they learned? They they just learn to do what I tell them, and and that's cool and all. And um, for people who are interested in that, you can just skip my notes, use my player pool, and off you go. Um, but guys like to learn, you know, and I want to, you know, want to teach. I want to help them. I I don't know everything, and you know, we're we're gonna have a losing week eventually, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, and so there's a good group of guys, um, and no girls yet. So I can say guys, um, there's a good group of guys in that discord. Um, we talk football all the time. Just had somebody else who's been following my content for a while, um, who joined today and reached out to me, tagged me. He's like, Hey man, I'm here because I love what you do and I want more insight. And I said, you're at the right place, my guy. Um, and so him and I went back and forth on some really good game theory kind of thought process about, Hey, it was actually about ownership percentage and how to get leverage and that kind of stuff. So we had a nice conversation there about that. And that's what you're missing out on. If you're not part of that all escort, all access discord channel, that's where, that's where the magic happens. This video was great, but the magic really happens there. So I would urge anyone who likes these videos, who thinks Keith is knows what he's talking about, who, who knows what I'm talking about, who thinks that, that Chris knows what he's talking about. Come on in there because you can literally, you know, just pick in my brain and we can talk about whatever it is specifically that that you're either having questions about or you know would like to learn more about or or you know or whatnot. So it's a it's a really cool place to be. But Keith, um, you want to go ahead and talk? I know that you obviously do things that don't involve me, so you want to let the people know where it is so they can find more more of you in your camo hoodie. Sure, uh, I didn't. You asked me not to wear a Falcon, so yeah, I have no. very many sweatshirts. That I not. demanded, I demanded <laughs> that you did not wear. Even though shirt. I still remember, like yesterday, a game we lost in London to you bastards. Uh, that I believe we were up twenty-four points in the second half and blew it. So I know that's shocking to people here. The Falcons blew a big lead in the second e- half. Even but. even the Lions win a game every now and again, Keith. <laughs> a lot, a lot more lately. But uh, yeah, you can gone. find me at Keith Fleming. That's where I mean, you can find links to all of my stuff. Uh, on Twitter. Um, Thursdays, me and Joe do the F6P DFS kickoff show. Again, we do play 6,900 and under. It's mostly for cash games. We're not yep. looking at deep cuts. We're looking at guys that we think, hey, they're going to do very well this week. So you Try must love get... my cash pool. I do. <laughs> I definitely do. Uh, no peeking, right? The, uh, no peeking. But we do, we do a median and a value play each week. I have a values article for DFS that comes out on Tuesdays. Uh, a stacks article that comes out on Fridays. And then every Wednesday I go on ESPN Northwest Florida. It's a show called the inside drive. Uh, and for two segments, we chop up DFS. It was the exception of this week where we talked Ryder cup for the entire first, segment. <laughs> uh, which what a waste of time that was, but I'll make sure and miss that. It was, awful. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, I, I'm so excited to be here. Me and Joe both. Honestly, the reason we came here is because of Dave and Chris and what you were just talking about is even though we've been doing this and we've been podcasting and stuff for three, four years, we want to continue to learn, refine, and get better. And that was why we came here, where we knew we were going to be the second banana. And that's okay. I want to learn. I want to get better. And I appreciate you guys being so accommodating and just helpful with any questions and stuff we have. Well, it's been a pleasure. Like I said, this is the first time we're actually working together. We've We've texted back and forth a little bit, um, you know, so, some fun stuff, some actual business, um, but it, it's been a pleasure. I, I truly look forward to working with you, you know, more and more as, as a season and as the years go on. So, so thank you for coming in and saving Chris at the last second. I believe he had to go get a, an emergency. Um, he had some, um, why can't I think of the word, some hemorrhoids. And he had to go to some emergency hemorrhoid surgery. So, Chris, if you're if you're hearing this, I hope your your butt's feeling well, my guy. And uh, we'll catch everyone next week. Thanks, Dave.